everybody. Welcome to Yeshua Network. We are facebook.com forward slash Yeshua official and today is day number one. We're just kind of chilling, relaxing while you guys log on. Say hello, please. Wherever you're from, please announce it. And uh, yeah, we're just going to be hanging out until everybody kind of logs on and then we're going to begin the conversation. I'm Nathan Wheeler, owner of the Yeshua Network and this is my good friend, Alex. Say hello, Alex. Hi guys. My name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Alex Lovovsky. As he said, his good friend, and we're excited to take this journey with you. Yeah. You guys, thank you so much for sharing this with you, uh, with your friends, your family, posting it on your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitters, and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> is it kind of quiet? Okay, hold on. We're, we'll crank up the sound here. Let's see. Is that a little bit better? Can you guys hear us now? How's the sound? Sound check. Can you guys hear us pretty good? Go ahead. Let us know if you guys are hearing us well or if we should Speak raise up. up the sound some more. Let's scroll down and see if that. Can you turn up the volume a bit? Is this better? Can you guys hear us better? Hello. <coughs> How about now? Okay, that should do it. Let's see. Let's see. It's a little quiet. Still. Hmm. All right, here's what we're gonna do, guys. We are going to actually exit off. I think I'm having technical difficulties. We're gonna log right back on. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back, okay? Oh, it is better. Okay, <laughs> sorry, there's a delay, there's a delay. All right, you guys, awesome. See, this is why we wait for everybody to come on. We do the little sound check, we, we smooth everything out. All right, you guys, remember too, as you are logging on, please announce where you are from, where in the world you live. And the reason why we think that that's really important is it allows you the opportunity to have fellowship in real life. If you see that somebody else is actually living in your neighborhood or in your part of the world or your country, and you know that they're also of the same belief, same mind, same spirit as the Bible commands us to be, well, you guys can actually link up and you guys can have fellowship together. So. Please announce where you're from. Get in touch with each other. Please don't be shy about meeting up and, and becoming fellowship friends on the internet with each other. Uh, even if it's somebody from the other side of the world, you know, you can fellowship through the internet too. If there's absolutely nobody in your part of the world where you can fellowship with, that's the benefit of being uh, an online ministry. Um, as you guys know, there are some parts of the world where it's still illegal to be a believer. So. Uh, if somebody writes you from another part of the world where uh, they don't have fellowship, you know, hopefully you'll be open-minded and say, nice to meet you, brother and sister, from the other part of the world. Uh, today, let's jump into this now. Um, what is today? Today is day number one of the entire Bible read-through. If you guys have ever watched a video with my ugly mug on it, you know that basically somewhere within the video, I will tell you, you need to read the entire Bible for yourself. Why do I say that? Is it just for fun? Is it just for kicks? Is it just because it's a really good read? Uh, no, the reason why I say that is because the actual Bible itself tells you to read the entire Bible. God actually says these words, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word of God. Not partial word of God, not semi word of God, but by every word of God. Now, it's one thing for me to say you should read your Bible and then just leave it at that. It's also another thing though, if I can actually help you read the Bible. Now, the one thing I've learned over the years, and especially here with my buddy Alex, he has blessed me in a big way because me and him have been reading the Bible again. And as Alex has been reading it, the one thing I've really learned, uh, which I believe to be true before we did this read through again with each other was, if you actually physically read it with your eyeballs, you get something very special from it rather than somebody telling it to you or listening to it on an audio. So that is also why I encourage you to read it literally read it yourself don't listen necessarily to an audio and that is why me and alex are not going to read the bible for you so today is not going to be a day where alex and i just sit here and talk about our experience with the bible we're about to ask you guys to engage we're hoping that you have read and you saw the post leading up to this video where we asked you to read genesis chapter 1 through genesis chapter 10. we're hoping that you guys did that or at least enough of you did that and you guys can tell us what your experience is like let me explain very clearly what this read through is going to be like. <clears throat> Let's see. Is this a little bit better? Can you guys hear me now? Somebody's saying they can't hear me. Um, okay. Really? Still very low. Hmm. All right. Let me see here. I don't know why it would be low. Let's see. One second. You guys, am I sounding louder or is it low as well? Hmm. Volume, please. All right. 
Listen up guys, I'm gonna say this pretty loud so you guys can hear me. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty. I want you guys to be able to hear me and Alex, pretty important that you guys be able to hear us. So we're going to log off. We're gonna actually do this again. I apologize, but uh, I want everybody to be able to hear us because I can't, going but it can't, growing. It's growing, it's getting better. I don't know. All right, give us one second you guys. We're gonna to have to, both are great, we're good. Have my volume on high. Hmm. You can hear me just fine. All right, well, <laughs> we're getting all sorts of different answers now. We're going to try to speak up and be louder, right? Yeah. There you go. So hopefully this will help you guys. All right, we're kind of actually yelling. <laughs> uh, okay. We're yeah. used to it. Sounds great. All right, well, some of you can. Then we'll keep going. All right, getting back to the point. Here's the point of this video. We actually want you guys to tell us what your Bible read-through experience was we want you to be able to use us as a soundboard, as a form of fellowship, because a lot of people who read through the Bible, they don't have anybody who they can bounce off their experience with because they don't probably know anybody else who's actually read the entire Bible all the way through. They only know other believers who have only read a passage here, a passage there, the New Testament maybe in its totality, maybe, and, and that's it. So there's a lot of things that they aren't able to fellowship with when they read the Bible. So today, you're going to tell us um, uh, how you experience the first 10 chapters of the Bible. And Alex and I are just going to be here to uh, bounce it off of, uh, bounce it back and forth with you, okay? So let's go ahead and start. Uh, we have a lot of people on now. Go ahead and you guys just can start typing and saying, you know, as I was reading through Genesis 1 or through the first 10 books, my experience was this. And you can tell about your uh, you know, was it overwhelming? Was it weird? Was it, did it seem too fantastical? Whatever it was. And why we do that, I'm actually going to pass the torch here and I'm going to ask Alex, since he also is reading the Bible for the first time, like you guys are, many of you are, I'm going to ask him what his experience was reading through Genesis 1 through 10 this last week. Okay. Well, put you on the spot. Great. No, it's it good. You. It's good. Let's get this started. So um, I've read through Genesis 1 through 10 in the past as as a, somebody that wasn't necessarily a believer yet and i'm not th those times i really don't want to even i can't remember and i don't really want to count them as as read throughs when i came fully into the faith in our lord jesus or in our lord yeshua excuse me <clears throat> i started to read um the bible again and this time it came to life for me like it had never come to life for me before and uh, prior to us sitting down just now, I actually went back and read 1 through 10 again. And I have to say, it's an amazing experience to come back to it again after having read much of more of the Bible. And, and you, you, begin to, you begin to relax into the reading of it where you're able to take it in bit by bit and get more details and more interesting things. And, and so it, it, it's enriching all over again. So... Um, you know, one of the things that was super awesome coming to it fully in the faith is now, now I knew I was reading something that was consequential to my life. It was no longer just a story. It wasn't some wonderful myth. No, I felt it. So I knew that there was a reality to it. And now it was consequential to my life. And it made the reading just so important and so cool. So um, in general terms, mm -hmm. without talking about specifically what I think I'm getting from the book now. Yeah. These are the, the, this is how cool, important, and, and alive it is for me still. Reading it again, I'm, I'm blown away again by, oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed this, or I didn't see this, or, or this makes a little sense if you look right. at it this way, and suddenly you're like, oh wait, the reason why you missed it the first time is you probably didn't quite get it, but you're so eager to get the story, you're going to glaze over and keep going, which is fine, which is totally fine, because there's, there's big obvious things in the story you have to get first. Right. But that's a very, very important point, which is why we're doing this read through the way we are. It's the reason why we're not reading the Bible for you. It's the reason why we're not telling you what to look for, what things that should be jumping out at you. Because the truth of the matter is, is that and we are actually going to go ahead and read some people because exactly what you said is exactly why we're doing this. It's about your experience with the Bible. It will speak to every single person watching this video and every person who ever reads the Bible ever on planet Earth. It will speak to each one of us differently. And we actually have somebody here who has a, a comment of what it was like. Uh, Manoj, I might be saying your name wrong. Please forgive me if I am. Here's what he wrote. He says, as you said in the past, you can talk about the Bible for years and years and never finish. 
That is because many people, me included, do not understand how God wrote the Bible. They do not know how to look for the hidden clues in the Bible. The Bible is not a chron uh, chronological order, nor does it have all information on any given subject in any one location or book. God spread out clues in the Bible in widely dispersed random patterns, hiding them in and around verses that are not always related. God can jump from one subject to another subject using a wide perspective of time periods, people, nat natural versus spiritual things, places, and many other ways that he has used to conceal information from his enemies. That See, this is so awesome because I agree with you, Manoj. I absolutely have, you can, you can easily see that, especially the second or third time you read the Bible. Some people will obviously notice some things the first time they read it in regards to exactly what you said. And that is why I tell people to read the entire thing in order. Because I believe, based upon what you just said, that when you get to a certain part of the Bible, you have now had a, a foundation of knowledge laid in your brain and in your heart, right? And when you get to that point, God reveals a nugget, kind of slips it in there, and if you get it, you're ready for it. Because if he knows that you've read the pre or the, the pre existing parts of the Bible up until that point, he knows that you're going to be more prepared to receive it. So that is a really awesome thing. Just to, just to add to what you're saying, it is, it, is both, it is both sort of hidden and mysterious and sometimes uh, seems purposefully uh, uh, a puzzle, but and not at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important to say that when you actually understand a nugget from the Bible that seems like it was hidden before but really isn't anymore and it's completely obvious, it might not be, an, uh, uh, you know, you figured something out or you, it, there, there might be a supernatural process happening. The Spirit has given you an understanding, a discernment of something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, while I, gr I, 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 you guys obviously looks like both Minaj and, and you have read the Bible obviously more than more often than I have. I also want to say that it is both hidden and not hidden. Sometimes we, we work too hard to try and make sense of something that isn't meant to be that that um, I'm about uh, to puzzling. Uh, David says, I find it interesting how there seems to be two perspectives of the creation. Yes. A big picture view. I saw that. Oh, I missed it. We can't go back. No, no, I, I, uh, no a big picture and a more intimate picture of right. Adam and Eve. Exactly. That's actually something we're going to be talking about as well, David. I'm glad that you mentioned that. If you guys didn't catch it, David says there seems to be two pictures of creation. There seems to be this first very general overview picture of creation, and then God kind of goes back and he gives a more detailed explanation. Now, while we do not want to break down the Bible for you, and we don't want to go over the details really yet, but what we do want to do is we want to see what, like those things, which, which do you, what, what stands out to you guys. So those are the kind of things, David, thank you. That's the kind of comment as well that we're looking for. Um, <coughs> what I think Nathan's saying also is we're prepared to talk about that specifically probably at another time, maybe a future video. Yeah. Because uh, it is a, we've just sort of recently come to it ourselves as a very interesting subject and a potential reason for why that is so. So. So Irene mm -hmm. says, my experience was calming me and also wanted to know more and more. Yeah, that's how it was for me too. And I think Alex as well. You know, the Bible actually is one of the most interesting stories, I think, in the world. I mean, in my opinion and Alex, we joke about this, how it blows like Lord of the Wing Rings out of the water. Yeah, about it. Yeah. It's just, it's so much more fascinating than any Harry Potter book. There's so much actual more magic and mystery and, and power. Uh, and, and, you know, all the things that in a way our little kid version of us kind of hope would be the truth of reality. Uh, you know, Book of Genesis really like fulfills that that kind of fantasy part of our, our life. So it's very interesting. Uh, I absolutely love reading through the Bible. I am using the one year Bible and it was great. It takes me two Old Testament readings and one new. Oh, I love that method, Marie. That's great. Uh, awesome. I, I think everybody should kind of do it that way, too, although it is a bit more reading. But if you guys can handle it, awesome. Samantha. Oh my God, Nathan Wheeler. Oh, I missed it. All right, we're going to have to jump some of these, you guys, if we miss it. It's only because you guys' are comments are coming so fast, we can't actually read through them all. Uh, the first time I read the Bible, I thought it was a good story, but when I read it again, I saw Yeshua everywhere, like Genesis 3.15, for example. Golf clap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It sticks out to you, right? I started doing your study. So what he's saying, you guys, is that the Bible very clearly begins to talk about Yeshua, Jesus, from day one. Very, very clearly, it actually be, it's telling you Jesus is coming 
from day one. And now you're able to see as you read everything in the Bible, it literally all points to him. These, this is exactly why we wanted you guys to comment. We wanted to see what you guys found. Um, let's see. I think even reading the Bible, if some parts of a book doesn't capture my attention or seems too hard to understand, it reminds me when I was in school. Yeah? So it can be a little overwhelming like when you have overload of the study. I can speak to that. It happens in several books, especially <coughs> post-Genesis as well. Uh, it, it's so, it, it, you're not, you're, there's you're not alone. Wrong, you're not alone. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. It can be a difficult text. Elaine says, yeah, I could never get past Genesis before. Elaine, well, I hope you will get past Genesis with all of us, with you today, fellowshipping, or th with this, this process. I hope together we can all get through it. God teaches each person uh, differently. Exactly, Don. God bless you and your family, brothers. Amen. You are a very good man. Well, we try to be. Let's see. Can still hear you guys. Okay, good. Um, each year, read through the whole Bible. It is different each time. Wow. Yeah, Marie. Great. So, so Marie says. Marie Moyer says she reads through the Bible each year, and every time it's different. And I can tell you myself, exact same thing. I mean, you've already begun to reread it, and already it's different. Mm -hmm. It's already saying some monumental things. Absolutely. You know what I mean? It's it's so crazy. And this, you guys, is why I use the the verge or the the, the verb, the vernacular that the Bible is living. Okay, here's one. I was confused about where Cain's wife came from, uh, and then... Yeah, that's a topic we'll talk about as well, so that's something that we could get caught on. I found the inner feeling of me growing up, feeling there is... Oh, this is just too fast. Yeah. We're going to have to jump ahead here, guys. I always understood Cain's wife to be his sister. When you are close to the root of the ancestral tree in the DNA, it's pure, was not dangerous. Yeah, that's, that's what most people would say. I mean, it would make sense... When we learn about the Bible, when you're reading Genesis, if there's only so many people on the island, you can only possibly be with somebody who might be your sister or your cousin. Now, early on in the stage when people were living 900 years old or very, very close to 1,000 years old, obviously uh, health and DNA and all that stuff was obviously structured a lot different than our living DNA. And if you do keep reading in Genesis or you keep reading through past Genesis, you actually see the point where God says the reason why he changed our lifeline and, and why he changed our health. So it's a, uh, that's something we'll actually get to. Uh, I believe in Genesis. Yeah. In Genesis, uh, yeah. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Post flood. I believe the sixth day of creation. This is Anthony. He says, I believe the six days of creation are literal days. I don't believe in the gap theory anymore. After reading it thoroughly, I believe to think anything else is able is, is added is to, to the Bible. Add to the Bible. Interesting. All right. Cain's wife is his sister. Have you read the hidden gospels? 23 years are missing of the Christ of, G of growing Jesus growing up. Uh, uh, I, I've read the non-canon books. I don't know. I know there's books that refer to what Jesus' childhood was like, right? But I can't say that I am can't familiar with that. them yeah, at this moment. Don, I totally agree with that. God teaches everyone differently. Spirit told me he speaks to me as I understand. He speaks to me how he knows I'll receive it. Amen. That's a good one, Jackie. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit reveals what he wills. Yep. When I first started, this is Kim Smith. She says, when I first started, it was a little difficult, not understanding any of it. It was like a different world. But it finally come to me, attending fellowship and consistently keeping a reading and memorizing certain verses. So you stuck with it. And that is actually something, this is the kind of comment that I was really looking for because I know that Kim Smith is like, probably most people reading through the Bible in the sense that it is so overwhelming and it's so magical and mystical that we think to ourselves, what am I reading? Am I supposed to be like totally understanding this 100%? And if you don't, you might have that little whisper in your ear from the devil saying you're not good enough, you don't understand, you won't ever understand this. So Kim, your comment is a real blessing because I know there's other people out there who are experiencing that and you did exactly what I tell everybody to do. Push through, keep going. Because he will give you revelation. He will give you understanding. And I love the sentence in the Bible. It says, reading the word of God never returns void. Even if you don't have the psychological understanding, your spirit is gaining something that you can't even fathom. And when the day comes, like a seed, it will sprout out and it will actually bear fruit. And it will be planted from maybe years ago. So it's important that you just keep pushing through. The God of the Old Testament is different than the New Jim, no. The God of the Old Testament is not different than the New. He is the same God, and that is a very important question to ask as you're reading through the Bible because they sometimes look different. 
and they are often taught to be different in personality, but they're not. And as you read through the whole thing, you will see how and why they are the same. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> wow, you guys are so awesome. So many comments coming in. If we skip your comment, you guys, feel free to copy and paste it again, literally, because you, we just have so many coming through and we, wanna, we want to engage you guys. We want this to be about you. Let's see, we have Tim Moore. He says, what about some of the books not in the Bible? So Tim, I'm just gonna stop right there because we had talked about that in the pre-video leading up to the launch of this. We will talk about those things after we're done and we might do a read through of those books after the Bible is done. I personally and under the un belief that every book uh, regarding the time period, regarding the faith, how it came here, uh, the, the saints and the people and the, and the scholars over the years that have written about the Bible, uh, how everything that we are today, how it all came to be, I believe all that is super important for believers to know. But every single believer should read the Bible first because it's a foundational discernment tool. It gives us the ability to discern when we read those other books what is of the Bible, what matches the Bible, and what doesn't. What's really of God's Word and what's man's, you know, added to it. And so my, my encouragement to everybody is you should read those books after you read the Bible because then you will have the discernment to be able to, to filter through what is man and what is God. Amen? So Amen. to any question like that, you guys, I hope you hear that one because I, I'm not opposed to them and I think you should read them, but the Bible first. The Bible is the only book where the author is right there with you explaining what he meant. Amen. Marie, that's a good one. Go ahead. I was just going to speak <coughs> quickly to the extra biblical books, especially you're mentioning the book of Enoch, book of Joshua. The, my, first, my first attempt to try and understand every nugget of Genesis was to go ahead and jump into those books. And, and they're, they're voluminous, they're a little bigger, and they go into more explanation. And I was so enthralled by it. I, I started jumping down rabbit holes, which is something we covered in the original video about this this Bible read through. So, yeah. um, awesome books, definitely check them out. Give the Bible a chance to explain itself first. Yeah, and so you you can testify that that especially reading through Genesis, there's so many rabbit holes and so many things that want you. It's like pushing you to read the external books. It's there's so many what you would consider to be gaps. That your mind goes, I don't feel I can move forward unless I have a better understanding. Is that true? Yes, that's right. Okay, did anybody else experience that while you were reading the first 10 chapters of the book of Genesis? Were you sitting there thinking to yourself, I just don't feel like I can move forward because I feel like my brain is just like, eh? What? What's happening? I need more information. I feel like there's no way I'm going to understand what comes next unless I fill in these holes. I believe that is a trap of the devil. I believe that that is his number one trap for anybody reading the Bible because it does, it does two things. It shows that we actually don't trust God's design of the Bible, that God actually has a reason why he says as little as he says in the beginning of the Bible. And it also allows us to veer off, get involved with these other books, get involved in online blogs, get involved in YouTube channels and, and all these conspiracy theories. And what happens? We never get back to the actual book which God has designed to point to our salvation, to point to our direct relationship to Him. And what happens is we get stuck with all these rabbit holes and all this extra, extra information. Not to say it's not true, not to say it's not right, but it's extra information that is not salvation driven, salvation like super focused, and not direct relationship with God. Do you get what I mean? It's just intellectual understanding. But what's more important than full intellectual understanding? And I'm not saying don't be educated, because I'm the person who's saying you need to be educated. That's why we're saying read the Bible. What I'm saying is, is be educated first with God right there on your shoulder. Learn his voice and what it sounds like, so that way you can discern those things. Wow, this is great. Now I can voice out what I really ought to on, uh, out of Genesis. I've been a Christian for now over 50 years. Ah. Oh. Could you post that again? Unfortunately, it moves so fast, we can't see it, you guys. And it actually doesn't allow us to scroll up anymore. So, unfortunately. Uh, what does it say? Earth of our home, the first oh, people. Okay. Well, there's... Uh, the letter J is only about 500 years old, yes. After 17 years of good marriage, my husband walked out of me. Wow, all right, well, that's not about the Bible, but we will pray for your marriage there, Patty. I'm sorry to hear that. Genesis 127, verse 7. Okay. Eddie Green, help, help, help. Can someone explain Genesis 127 and Genesis 
127. What is happening here? Let me look 127 up real quick. <laughs> that's that's what we that's what we're talking about. Okay. Genesis 127. Here we go. And God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him male and female. All right, this is good. This is real good. And then we're going to go to what was it? Genesis 2:7. And Jehovah formed man of the dust and the ground and breathed in his nostrils. I love it. Okay. <clears throat> that, <laughs> what you just found there, sir, is something we will be discussing. I'm glad that you found it. I know other people find it, and most people probably glaze right over it. I know I had the first time that I read the Bible, obviously. And uh, we are going to be talking about that in the future. For right now, we just want to kind of get the general overview. Please keep that question coming. Do not let us forget about it in future videos. Maybe the next video we will actually address it. But we want to set the standard with this video that we really want it to be about your guys' experience, not so much of let's break down every single word, but on certain things that you're going to get stuck on or certain rabbit holes that will cause you to really be confused and not move forward, we want to address those, okay? Genesis 126, he's basically asking the question of why God refers to himself as us when he's creating man, let yeah. us do it. Yep. Um, good should, question. It's a good question. I, I think he might be talking about the host of heaven. It's him and his army of angels that he's that he's referring to as being on the same team. But I don't know if you if you've got a specific answer for that. Well, no, that's that's what I would say too. Is it's he's referring to the angels. He's he's including them in the process. He's including them in that the fact too that they actually you know minister to us. They serve us. Uh, you know, he says that the angels are there to serve us, that we will actually be judges of the angels on the judgment day and so forth. So when he says us, it's kind of, um, you know, it was used in Shakespeare, actually. It's called a royal we. Uh, he really means himself because he's the ultimate authority, but he's kind of including everybody in the kingdom. So they all feel a part of it. So kind of like a good CEO talks about the whole company rather than it is I who built this, right. whatever it was. Yeah, exactly. It's, <clears throat> You can Google the word royal we. <laughs> it's a, it literally a real thing. This is amazing. This is confirming that God wants me to stop uh, spreading so much money on devotions. Oh, I missed it. Sorry, guys. Okay, let's see. we got to scroll down more and catch up to you guys. Let's see. I saw somebody say something about e-sword. Here we go. Translation original language is different, e-sword. Yep, Laura Stewart. I'm really glad that you got e-sword. I'm really glad that you're reading it with the original languages through the Strong's Concordance. In my opinion, it is the only way I really like to read the Bible. Uh, now, I'm not saying that any other way you read it, it doesn't work, that it doesn't reach you, it won't speak to you. But if you do read it using the eSword tool with the Strong's Concordance and you just mouse over the numbers or the words, it will give you the original language. It is so unbelievably more accurate and powerful. Obviously accurate, but powerful as well. Uh, the Word of God, Tony Sanders. The Word of God is as relevant today as it was when it was written. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Margaret. Uh, wow, this is great. Now I can voice out what I really ought to on a Genesis. Thank you. You reposted it. I've been a Christian now for 50 years, so what I now am getting out of this chapter is, yes, God created heaven and earth, but you see a lot of people came to me. Where did the dinosaurs and cavemen <laughs> so reading the creation of the earth and heaven, the Bible says God created living creatures in the sky and waters. Also, he created human beings. Now, when you read in Genesis, you see that God doesn't call them by name. And remember that one day a God is, is 10,000 years on earth. God created heaven and earth in seven days. Now, how hard is it there, this to hear? But after God saw that the human beings weren't cultivating, he decided to make man, Adam and Eve, later on his creation. Ding. More later. Yeah. Very, very good. I'm glad that you rewrote Margaret. Margarita. Margarita. Mar Margaret. Yeah. Margaret. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, you know, we're reading very. We're fast. excited. Yeah, we're excited. Uh, but listen, I'm really glad that you noticed that too. The Lord is good, and this is why this Bible read through together is such a blessing, <laughs> because we're a thousand minds as opposed to one. And that's the thing. We're all going to pick up on something different. But if we come together as we're supposed to do of one mind and one spirit, what things will God give you and you and you and you and you and everybody? And we all come together and we might have a full picture. We might actually be able to see God, if you will, in a higher definition. If each one of us is a pixel of God as we read through the Bible and we each share our pixel of God, how much more of a high definition image are those of us who are doing this read through together going to get than maybe the world has ever seen before? 
only made possible because of technology. Bam, and the Bible even prophesizes about that, the, the age of knowledge. That's the age we're in. And I believe that the internet has, uh, has been prophesied in the Bible. Get to that later, but I think what we're doing is important. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Here's one that I can attest to. It says, I get confused with all the translations and it's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. So I'm using eSword as well. And, there, and I've downloaded a, a, a ton of things. I've downloaded plain English versions and, and the American Standard and King James and the Septuagint. And I, and I bounce around between when I get something that just this, uh, either something I don't understand. So I go to the plain English version. And then sometimes I've noticed as, I'm, as I get caught up in reading the plain English version because it's so easy, I'll go back to the uh, American Standard or, or the King James and I'll find that the meaning is totally different. So you've got to be careful with the plain English version. Sometimes they, they, they try to explain too much rather than literally translate. So yes, it can be confusing. Yes, you're gonna have to bounce around the different translations. They're not so different that it's completely, you know, in, in uh, completely ununderstandable. But, you know, for, for times when, it, when, the, when you can't truly grasp it, it might not be the translation's problem. It might be that the Bible is yet to reveal to you what that meant. Mm -hmm. So keep reading. Amen, that's good, good word by us. Josh, Josh Word says, this is a rabbit hole for me and that is, if we have free will, then how can God have a predetermined plan for our life? Doesn't that mean we do, we do not have free will? Wouldn't that imply that everything that happens, like the guy who turns away from the faith because of doubt and dies and goes to hell, that isn't God's will for him to turn from the word and go to hell? Question mark. So Josh, what you're talking about is a very complicated thing, and it's a question that we will all be asking until the day we get on the other side. God said he will have grace on whom he shall have grace. If somebody comes into the flock and somebody receives Christ and then something horrible happens in his life or something happens to his brain or drug addiction or something, whatever it is that causes a person to fall away, are they going to hell? Well, that is an absolute possibility, right? If they choose to go to hell, if they actually say, I'm done with you, God, that is a possibility. Now, if God knew that ahead of time and he allowed it to happen, well, he allowed it to happen. That doesn't mean that he forced it to happen. And so free will does absolutely exist. And in our free will, we always have the choice every second of every day to both choose Christ's salvation or to deny Christ's salvation until our very last breath. And so that is why there is the white throne and that is why there's the marriage throne. The marriage throne is for those who stay with Christ, who walk with Christ, and they are guaranteed entry into heaven because they have his name written on their hearts. The, mer the white throne is actually where those people actually get judged. It is the judgment seat. It is where people's lives are recapped and reviewed and Satan is there accusing them of every little tiny thing and it's up to Christ once again he is the door in he alone decides and that's where the white throne comes in that's where people will be judged and so we just have to hope for for God's sake for Christ's sake that those people are shown grace and mercy and that's that but your question is a very good one and predestination well predestination never actually applies to pre-salvation, predetermined salvation. Predestination or pre, uh, like being chosen by God. For instance, David was chosen. Elijah was chosen. It doesn't guarantee your salvation. What it guarantees is that you will play a role in the arc of God's story on earth in his message going out into the world and his objective being accomplished, which will solidify the opportunity for other peoples to know his truth and know his word. So let us not get confused with, are we predestined to hell? Are we predestined to heaven? The answer to that is no. Are we predestined to serve God? Are we predestined to fulfill the will of God? Yes or no? That is a possibility. That is where predestination comes in, in reality. Kelly right. says, I got stuck on something in Genesis that really bothered me, but kept going, got to Genesis 25, and then, got, and then started to get bored, and then life got in the way, and really, really haven't felt the pull on my heart to read, which I find strange and discouraging. Go you ahead, know, I was just going to say <laughs> that I'm actually right now stuck in Psalms. Mm -hmm. it, for me, the book, it, it has, it, it, it just, I am mired in it like a swamp. I'm having a really hard time getting through it, and I keep finding my brain kind of drift in other directions. So I can relate to what you're saying. Um, uh, don't wait for it to pull on you. Try to come to it. Now that you've realized that you're having no inspiration to go back to the book, one thing you could do is go find that place in Genesis that has bothered you and ask us. Mm -hmm. We might be able, or ask anybody we're fellowshipping with, fellowshipping with here, mm -hmm. they might be able to provide some understanding 
or some ministry to that specific thing that will hopefully, you know, make you interested again. Mm -hmm. But when you have moments where you feel like you're done with this, just that's not of you. That's mm -hmm. the bad guy. Mm -hmm. He might be whispering into your ear, distracting you, making you doubt that what you've read is the word of God and has meaning for you. So. Mm -hmm. Whatever that problem is that you stumbled on, bring it forth. We'll yeah. deal with it. That's exactly why we're doing this. This is about fellowship. Like I said, it's not about Alex and I reading through the Bible and telling you guys what's up. It's about you guys bringing us your experience exactly like you did, Kelly, and let us know. In fact, uh, Rachel, you ask a question, what Bible version you recommend, uh, and you list a few. The ones that we recommend, and here's why I've read uh, literally a, a lot of them, I would say probably a good 20, 30 versions, um, I would recommend the New American Standard Bible for the English, first and foremost. Second to that would be the King James 1611. And many people think that, they're, that all the King James versions are the same, they are not. If you want the most accurate King James version, it would be the 1611, which is also the absolute most difficult one to read. It is as hardcore Shakespearean raw as you can get. Other than that, the best version you can read is the original language, and you can do that with eSword app, eSword.net, okay? Right. Yeah, quickly attack ahead. that one. So Anthony is asking a question. Anthony, Miss Miss Treta, uh, there's a lot of talk today over young versus old Earth. What is our take? I'm just going to quickly jump in, and because uh, I've had a, some small background in science before I got into, you know, thank, before I was saved, thank God. So I'd like to quickly address this. Um, there's a whole. The whole world is going to tell you that the Bible isn't right because the Earth is much older than the Bible states that it is. There's two things that may be happening here. One, science is measuring the Earth incorrectly. They're using constants that they have found to be true right now at this moment to talk about what happened in the past. Every single dating equation uses some kind of constant. It says that the speed of light, for example, travels at a certain speed. Do we actually know that it has always traveled at, this, at that speed? Do we know it travels at that speed outside of our planet? So you get into this whole mire of things. The Bible is saying, you can go ahead and lose yourself in looking at clues of me in other places, right? But here I am, I'm giving you my word. It begins to become somewhat irrelevant whether the earth is young or old or what the deal is. If you want to know me, have faith that you will, just read. Just read the Bible. Skip over those parts that make you doubt because the world is doing its hardest, its best, to make you think that the Bible is a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's not totally in the faith or of the faith or who's left the faith that I talk to, they all say the same thing. Oh, the Bible is a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. They all say it. Yeah. So don't listen to that. Just to add one thing, because you're not the only one obviously asking that question. We are seeing the other questions. So if there's something like that that everybody's kind of stuck on and, and most people do get stuck on, uh, you know, let me add this to you. If you do notice... The Bible says the light went and the light went out. It does not say that the earth rotated a full rotation with the sun and moon. Look at what day God created the sun and moon. Look at what science says about when the sun and moon were created. Ironically enough, believe it or not, the Bible matches very accurately what science even says. Now, am I validating science? No. What I'm trying to say is that it's funny that these guys in science are trying to understand what the Bible has already told us. And the Bible does say that when the light shone, it was like a gas. It doesn't say that it was a solid ball of light in the sky. It just said he created light. And what we do know based upon new or what science would call young parts of the universe is that they actually start as a glowing gas of light. They're not forming a star yet. They're just this glowing gas. Now, if that gas should dim and go out on itself, collapse upon itself and become a star, could we say that that was one God day? And according to science, if that took 10 billion years or a billion years, maybe that would be psycho crazy connection. What does it say? So <clears throat> here we have a reference to the Trinity and I thought we should, oh, you hold should on. address it. Yeah, so, so it just matches. You, you just have to not get stuck on these things because again, it, the more you actually look at Genesis and really pay attention to the details, which we will get in later. We don't want to get in today, but if you do pay attention to these details, and some of you have actually spotted it, and we're going to be talking about them a little later as we pass through Genesis. Maybe we'll go back and recap. But right now, we just want you guys to experience it um, because that is truly, truly the most important part is because when you're experiencing the Word of God, you are actually experiencing God, okay? So important note, 
pay attention to those details. If you get stuck on those things, you might find that the answer is actually looking you square in the eye if you read it a little bit slower and just take it as for what it says, not what your pre-existing concept of it says. That is why we're doing it this way. That is why we're doing it slow. We're reading it through with you guys and participating with fellowship because we're going to encourage you, look at it one more time. Something might jump out at you. Go a little slow. Forget what your pastors told you. Forget what the general population has said. Read it one more time and see if it, something makes sense to you about it. That's the point of this read through. Okay, you, let's see. I know it passed, but it passed. Somebody, they'll, they'll repost it. Somebody, I think, was re referring to the question of us again. Yeah, yeah. And they're saying, no, they're not talking about the host of angels. They're talking about the Trinity, the Son, yeah. the, Son the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Right. And I don't know if we're ready to get into no. that subject yet. But that is, that is, a, great, that is a great thing to, to hold on to. Some people do believe there's basically going to only be two options, right? Or three options, really. There is a third option, which is ridiculous if you actually know the Bible at all. First option is, is that he's talking about him, God, and the angels with him who actually have dominion over heaven. And, and they do jobs. They have jobs, and they have specific jobs where they have dominion over certain parts of heaven. So we know that as we continue to read and when you read external Bible books. But the other thing is, is the other option is, is that he's talking about the, Holy, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? Which... I'm really glad you're saying this, and I hope everybody, you're not going to remember this, but I hope you guys remember this. We will recap this towards the end. Some people believe that when God says we will create man in our image, that he's saying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, making it three different persons. Okay, think about that for a second. Three different persons, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's the second option. And the third option is, is that there's actually more than one God. So that option is just crazy, but that could be what it means. So, uh... We will get to all that as we read through the Bible. I can testify the Bible will absolutely answer that for you of who he's referring to. That is why I'm saying don't get stuck on these things. Don't go and search the internet about it. Don't go and watch thousands and thousands of YouTube videos about it. Trust the Bible will answer it for you in due time. Go ahead. Got one? Um, yeah, there's been so many. It's going I know, crazy. so but, awesome. Um, here's one that's really short. Where did Adam come from? Yeah. From he was dust of the earth, raised up, fashioned, and the breath of God's spirit was put into him to give him life. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. So this one, Patrick, were Noah's sons Shem, Ham, and uh, Joseph F. triplets? Okay, triplets. No, I don't no. believe so. They were all of different ages. Yeah, they came at different times. Where did Adam come from? Well, oh, you read that one. Okay. Yeah. God wants us to love him because we choose to. He did not want puppets. Exactly. Correct. Okay, let's see. Again, guys, if we didn't read your comment, chances are because we have so many coming in. We actually have 291 comments, so we're trying to get through as many as we can. Remember, too, that the reason why we're reading comments and we want you guys to be involved is a very good chance, as we see already, most of you are experiencing pretty much there's like five or six categories that everybody's kind of saying, this is what jumped out at me. There's like five or six topics that, that people are, are noticing about the first 10 uh, chapters of the Bible. And that is why we wanted to do this. We want to make sure you guys know you're not alone. I like that one. Can I do that one? Uh, yeah. Is there still a cherubim guarding the tree of life in the east garden, in the east of the garden? If so, why is the tree still being protected if Adam and Eve were already ate from it? So, no, I don't believe that the Garden of Eden is hanging out right now on earth. It, it, there may be a spot on earth where it was, but the flood that we read about later basically wiped it out mm -hmm. is, is one way of, of understanding that. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, uh, speaking of the tree of life, I think if you keep reading the Bible, you will also find out what the tree of life is. Uh, and so it doesn't really need protection anymore. Hmm. So keep reading the Bible. You'll, 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 uh, you'll hear about that. Yeah. Keeping our lips locked, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, isn't this fun? So you guys have some people who, who've read ahead and, and we know some things that are coming. So we can just say encourage you, which we will do time and time again throughout this read. Keep going. You'll get an answer to that. But knowing that you have somebody who, who has the ability to say that answer is coming kind of gives you like a little sigh of relief, doesn't it? I, I know it would me if, if I That's, had it. Yeah, it, it gave to me when I would speak to, to Nathan about that myself. And you have found out that I wasn't lying. Yes, exactly. Every time. Okay, see? <laughs> so, so he can testify that I'm not lying because he's going through the process you're going through. So Thanks, yes. Jeff, for the shout out. He liked my answer about the earth. Awesome. <clears throat> Yes. Amen. Renee, I love that you guys are answering each other. Awesome. Perfect. God is good. Leave out the bad. Okay, let's see. Where does it say about the age of the earth in the Bible? Well, 
it kind of breaks it down in the storyline. So it doesn't actually say the Earth is blank so many years old. What it does is it, it breaks down a day, a day, and then how old Noah is, and then how old his son is, right? Adam and Eve, uh, the first, okay, hold on. <laughs> Can't do that to me, buddy. So, you can, so yeah, you have, um, you, it just, it breaks down the, a time period of how, some, how long somebody lived. It doesn't actually ever say it. Blank, the Earth is this old. So, all right, where was it? Adam and Eve were the first Jews, not the first people. Bam, Sandy, microphone drop. <laughs> that is that is something we will be talking about when we're done reading Genesis. So I'm glad that you guys are you guys are. See, here's a wonderful thing. If some of you may be reading some stuff and you're like, wait a second, what about this? What about that? And and you may be if somebody just said this, is that true? Where are they getting this? These are the kind of things that I think what we'll do is we'll do a recap. We'll do a recap after we've read the book. And that way everybody's caught up, everybody has read the same information, and we'll go back and we'll point out some things that maybe you missed. Instead of reading it for you and breaking it down every second, every sentence as we go through, because that would take forever and a day, it's better for you guys to literally get the experience first and foremost, and then we'll go through. But I'm glad that you made that, Sandy. That's awesome. Uh, twist the word of God. Yes, Patrick says, Na Patrick Nash, scientists twist the word of God. Could not agree with you more, good sir. They actually do not want God to exist because... They don't like the idea of God, or they don't like the idea of being accountable, or they themselves want to be God. You know, they want to be their own God. They want to be in control of their absolute own destiny and what happens to them, right? Yeah. I, I just saw somebody, you know, arguing about the idea of who was the first Jew. I'd like to jump in real quick, and we're way ahead, but just uh, of where we should be. Jump ahead and real quick and say the word the word Jew or Jewish actually doesn't refer necessarily to all the children of the promise. When we read the Bible, we have to know that the word Jewish didn't exist. It was at the time. It was in Abraham's case, he was a child of the promise God made to Abraham. Or right. uh, Abraham's children are children of the promise God made to Abraham. And as we go, they're called the Israelites. And only way, way later when it's just two of the tribes left, Judah being one of them and ruling Jerusalem. And, and, and then we start calling them Jews in modern times. So the word Jewish or Jew isn't really relevant to much of the Old Testament. So I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. All right, we wow came across you. This is Linda. Came across you by chance, or did God want me to find you? I struggle with reading as I have a neuro neurological condition. I learn more from people reading to me and listening to things like this. Well, see, Linda, you're not alone though. You don't need a neurological condition for that to be the case. I'm that way. If I have somebody I can talk to about what I just got done reading, that is going to allow me the ability to remember better what I just read. It'll stick, and I'll be able to apply it to my life more easy, you know. So that is the reason why we have decided to do this. Alex and I had this fellowship as we were reading through the Bible again. Specifically, Alex was reading through it for the very first time, and he had the ability to just come and call me up and come over and say, "Hey, Nate, I want to hang out and talk about what I've read in the Bible." And it was such an amazing blessing for him that we realized we needed to uh, to be able to offer this to everybody. And so you guys are participating in this fellowship. We're these, glad that it blesses you. These content relevant questions, right, within the first 10 chapters mm -hmm. are coming so fast, we're totally unable to keep up. Yeah. April, you had a question right before the one, you had a question about, before chapter six, and you're asking about the Nephilim, you had a question about something else that was interesting as well. If you could repost some of these and, and everybody kind of maybe slow down just to that so we can try no, and catch up. No, don't slow down. Just keep <laughs> reposting just it keep if repost we don't. Yeah. If we don't see it, just keep reposting it. It just means that it's getting lost. Unfortunately, Facebook actually limits our ability to uh, scroll all the way back up. So really weird. I didn't know they did that. Uh, Science is just catching up. Okay, let's see. Please begin to explain about these. Okay, yeah, April. Please could you explain about the serpent's offspring and Eve's offspring? That is us telling you exactly what it means. It's something that you will absolutely learn about, but we'll give you a hint. This is something we can do. We can give you a hint. Eve's offspring is the Messiah. The devil's offspring is not actually the offspring of, this, of the serpent, but it, it is. It talks about it. But really, it's, it's uh, the demons, fallen angels, which become demonic demons, devils, things like that. Uh, and in the garden, I'll just kind of give a little hint. I guess I'm giving him more than a hint. But in the garden, right before Yeshua goes on the cross, he bruises his heel by stomping on the serpent's head. Yeshua is the Adam before Adam, right? He, he says, before uh, Abraham was, I am. He, he was there before he was the Lord walking in the garden with him, right? 
And so he is the one who bruises his heel on the serpent. So that is what that's talking about. It's, it's a, again, as somebody had mentioned before, they see Yeshua, Jesus, even from day one, from the beginning of the first word of the Bible, Yeshua is explained. And that is one of the times that Yeshua is prophesied. Right then and there with Eve and the, and the, and the serpent in the garden. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Okay. All right, you guys, so let me ask you this question because a lot of people are doing exactly what we thought would happen, which is cool. Uh, but, but, um, what? Oh, okay. Okay. Let's see the one of Yeshua. Okay, okay Dor Doreen says Cain offered fat. Is that not great? So, Doreen, you ask a good question. What you're talking about is when Ka Abel offered his... his uh, Cain did not offer fat. Abel offered the fat of the sheep. Cain offered just the, the, the herbs and the, right. and the plants. Yeah, so uh, Abel was the one who offered the animal sacrifice, and then Cain had animals. So one was a, was a herder, a rancher, and the other one was a farmer, right? So one had plants, the other one had animals. God was obviously very excited about the fact that he chose the, the perfect, clean, flawless animal to, to, to sacrifice to him. And then when, when Cain offered the uh, plants, God was like, didn't even say anything. He kind of ignored him. And, and Cain got a little jealous because he wasn't, you know, getting the attention. Um, and, he, and then he says, God says to him, if you just kept doing it for your whole life and you got blessed in the end, what difference does it make? Right? That's, that's his response. Like, why did you need me to, to give you the same level of praise? Well, the difference is obviously a plant life and an animal life is significantly different. So I think it was just that God was trying to say, wow, I can't believe you are willing to sacrifice this animal's life in order to say how much you love me. You know? And I think it was just that one had one and one had the other, so Cain felt inadequate. And out of jealousy, he killed his, his brother. And uh, you know, if you keep reading, uh, you know, you'll learn that unfortunately the Cain and Abel situation plays a role in humanity. It tells a story about humanity today. It tells a story about Yeshua and tells a story about the lineage of God and, and, and how God really importantly wants a pure line. If you guys read, read uh, the Genesis, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to point out something again. If you read chapters 1 through 10 one more time and you look at the story of Cain and Abel, You'll notice that God stops telling the lineage of Cain and Abel. He stops telling their lineage, and he starts with a new lineage. I won't say who it is, but we know who it is. And, and basically God says, you know, uh, Adam, Eve, you guys are going to have another kid, and this kid's not going to mess up, and it's from this kid that I'm going to bless the lineage of because the other two, it, things didn't work out so well. So go back and read, and you're going to notice this. You're going to notice a new lineage was started, and everything that we know from Yeshua all the way back to Adam and Eve goes through this third lineage that was created, okay? So there's an importance to what you're noticing, you know? Um, maybe sometimes God does speak to a person. Do we, we not have this kind of experience? We feel that maybe there's a prophet or maybe there's somebody who it seems that God is totally blessed and, and loves them. And the other person gets a little jealous, so they actually act out. Right. Yeah. And in that acting out, they actually dig a hole for themselves that wasn't there. You know, they they weren't grateful for what it was that they had. They act out. They even maybe even attack the person who they feel has more in a way to spite God or just to to, to have a tantrum. And, um, and and they miss out on the blessings that God had in store for them for their whole life. You know, they weren't able to see the blessings they had. You know, they were coveting their neighbor. They wanted what their neighbor had. Yeah. And that's why I think it's in the Ten Commandments. Again, stuff that's important to point out to. So yeah. hard for us not to like jump on. All I these know. Things, I, right? I want to jump a little bit on the yeah, Cain. Yeah, go ahead, thing. please. This is what occurred please. to me now. We're talking about uh, Cain offering up the fruits or uh, the seeds of, of his farming, and Abel offering up his sheep. Well, we also see that in the ancient world, when you were herding animals and you had many animals, you were the rich man. Mm -hmm. The person who tilled the field was not necessarily so. So um, what we're, what we're, what we're, what we're, the story here is, is not necessarily that God said to Cain, oh, well, I, I don't think what you gave me is all that cool, so you, you, you're not cool. It, it's not that God uh, uh, you know, rejected him. It's that God was maybe genuinely praising uh, Abel for doing something new, which is sheep herding, which is actually later something that is used as a parable to what Yeshua, Yeshua does for us. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, God may have singled them out and said, oh, I like what you did there. That's new. That's cool. This is exactly what the sheep are for. This is perfect. Yeah. And then uh, Abel felt jealousy for not being singled out for praise. Yeah. And God said to him, which we read, what are you doing? Don't you know that you're about to cross over? You're about to sin greatly. Stop your jealousy, essentially. And Cain doesn't listen and kills his brother. And at that point, God still has mercy on Cain, does not uh, uh, take his life, basically says nobody shall take your life um gives him well now i'm getting into the details mm -hmm. but uh, uh so the the story of mercy is there in genesis in that very first crime of passion god still has mercy yeah exactly um well, let's get to some more of you guys' questions so i see what uh tania god appointed abraham as the father of nations and introduced circumcision since then, the Jewish nation of Israelites were known as God's chosen people. Yep. Uh, speaking of science, okay. How do you request? Repost. Just copy and paste it and put it right back in the comment. If you're asking how to repost your, your thing, just copy and paste what you wrote and put it back in. Um, we are obviously not going to be able to get to all these, you guys. You guys are amazing. 563 awesome. comments already, <laughs> and we've been excited. on for literally less than an hour. Uh, you guys are such a blessing. We're so blessed to know that you guys are reading the Bible with us. That is so awesome. Um, wow, so now you guys are answering some of your questions. This is great. Um, there we all go in. Uh, is the Bible. Okay, so listen, I see some of you suggesting that people go and they Google stuff, and, and I'm not opposed to having the external knowledge. But, but that's actually the beginning of the chasing of the rabbit holes. This is, this is the beginning of, of finding out, you know, external things that are going to get you confused you'll stay on those things they'll drain your energy you'll get totally discouraged you'll still feel confused and you won't read through the bible which answers itself which gives you that satisfaction and completion of relationship with god so while i'm not saying don't go on the internet and don't research it i am saying read through the bible first make notes maybe make like a journal that you you put and you write a question in your journal and see that as you read through if the bible doesn't answer it or if it does answer it scratch it off if you read through the entire Bible and your question hasn't been scratched off, then go and do the research. But, but I am telling you as somebody who has read the entire Bible multiple times, and I'm telling you as people I've watched try to read the Bible straight through and they did not ever get through it, it's because they chased rabbit holes. So please, please, please let me encourage you all, read the Bible first, keep those notes and go back and answer those questions or Google those questions and watch videos or blogs or anything you want on them later, please. I cried, the words are alive. It's a map of truth, past and present and future, and I'm just sitting crying, don't know why. <laughs> ah, woo! Praise the Lord, April. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. See, it's a living thing. It literally touches you. Okay. Um, April, you also had a comment about uh, Adam and Eve having children pre-fall. I don't believe, I, I personally haven't interpreted it that way, didn't get hit with that. So I'm just, I'm trying to address your, your question there. It doesn't tell us that. Uh, it doesn't tell us that they had children pre-fall because it doesn't say that Adam knew even to go into Eve to have relationship with Eve in a sexual manner until after they ate the fruit of knowledge. Uh, and it wasn't until after they were actually uh, kicked out of the garden that they were then um, they were then able to uh, understand or have sex, if you will. So the Bible doesn't explain that they would have had sex prior to that. They kind of didn't know what those things were for, really, based upon how the Bible reads okay Tonya Renee McClurley I think it's coming to the place where I'm trying to make my wrongs right are you okay that's a great comment are you trying to say that you're trying to say the things that you've done wrong were right or are you trying to say that the Lord is convicting you of the things you've done wrong and he's convicting you to change your ways and, and start doing right? That is actually the definition of repentance if it's the later of the two choices that I'm asking you about. The actual definition of repentance is to change your ways. It doesn't mean to just sit there and say, I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, modern day Christianity teaches that repenting is saying, I'm sorry. And that's not actually the, the actual word. The actual word is to turn and go the other direction. So, good comment. Um, Karina, is using cannabis and CBD for pain a sin? 
Well, Karina, Genesis 1 through 10 doesn't talk about that yet, but I'll tell you what, if you keep reading, I believe that that will be answered for you. I'll just say that. Uh, I would say, according to what you're going to read, the answer is no, it's not. But anything, whether it's water or sugar or anything, if you indulge in it and it causes you to be unhealthy and not able to be what God has called you to do, then that is the sin. Uh, but the Bible does have a sentence about you being healthy and getting your healthiness from all the things of the earth. But we'll get to that passage as we continue reading. Yeah. Um, can <clears throat> grab power and control the TOS. Oh, I'll, I'm glad, Shana, that you're, you're, you're seeing some uh, relief there. It says, phew, okay, I was feeling bad for Cain. Uh, why I really want to understand what happened, but I know God is good always, so I get it now. Nice. Yeah, there's there's actually uh, w once I got I want to say again the, the fullness of the faith, mm -hmm. and I reread the Garden of Eden story, and I reread uh, when 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 Adam and Eve get kicked out, I had a completely different understanding of how God is good mm -hmm. in that moment, rather than what I used to feel before. I used to feel like, well, that's not fair. Yeah. Well, they just were curious, and <laughs> anyway. We'll finish it. So well, my, my point basically is, is your is that experience was you got, you got I, yes. your spirit got got m got settled. My spirit got settled. I knew okay. that that not only was God, was God in the right to do what He did, He was actually in, in making sense. From my, yes, making sense and from my interpretation, doing two things: one, giving us humans what we want, mm -hmm. even though it may not be good for us. Right. He knows better, but we wanted it so bad, so He said okay. And second, it all leads to salvation. It mm -hmm. will all lead to Him coming here. To earth to save us. So, huh? yeah, pretty good stuff. Are the Nephilim or remnants of them living among us today? Um, all right. I don't know if a remnants is, but was there new Nephilim being created? Uh, I believe it's possible. Yes, there are testimonies of soldiers, at least from America, saying that while they were over in Iran and Iraq and stuff, that they actually saw literal giants in caves and. Um, and uh, I think that I don't I think, think these guys are doing hoax. Yeah, Afghanistan. That's yeah. what it was. Uh, and and I believe that could they be up to their ways again? Could these angels be up to their evil ways again, as we saw in the Old Testament? Absolutely, they could be. Um, but would they be remnants? Like, would all these you know giants have lived and kept having babies and stuff? Well, we know that David killed a giant named Goliath, but I don't know if they were able to literally hide out for all these years and not be seen. So what I would say is that they are, uh, that they are uh, back at it again. If if they're here, it's because the the fallen angels are back at it again. Yeah. Yeah. There's now we're stepping outside of Genesis one right. to ten, and there are actually ex extra biblical materials to talk about how the fallen angels that have caused the Nephilim to be here are going to be back, and now might actually be the time when they are. So, welcome. Okay, I love this, Luis. Bucchoy? Am I saying right? Bucchoy? 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 I'm really horrible at foreign names, you guys. I'm like the worst in the world. So, Luis, if I'm saying your name wrong, please forgive me. But I love what you said. All answers are in the Word. I couldn't agree with that more. All answers are in the Word. And the more that me and Alex have been going through the Word, we have found some answers that have absolutely blown our minds. So much so, it's hard for me to receive some of them. It's hard for him to receive some of them. Uh, you know, it, it's such a thing that we have all been indoctrinated so much with a preconceived idea of what's in the Bible that if we are able to just read the Bible word for word as it is written without the preconceived idea, there is so much unbelievable amount of truth and answers. More importantly, the answers you think that are not in the Bible, I can testify they're there. They're there. We just have to be able to not have our preconceived ideas that are pre-planted in our minds speaking louder than the words are to us. Do you guys study the Hebrew and Greek languages? Renee, yes, I do. I prefer to only read the Bible in the original languages. I find it to be the only way to really have an absolute understanding of what you're reading. I'm not saying that if you are reading an English version or another language version that you're not getting something from it, but in my opinion, the only way to get the absolute truth is to read in the original languages. So the scene see. says it draws you closer to the reality we're living in. If you can read it and see it in the real world, Amen. smiley face. Amen. Amen. Maxine, good comment. All things start to make sense when you begin to look at it through the lens of the Bible, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. You can read the Bible. Sometimes you'll see something different. 
Yes. Um, <laughs> I've been Googling rabbit hole, <laughs> taking notes too. You actually Googled the term rabbit hole. That's good. Okay. Uh, I hope that my tidbits are not confusing anybody. Yeah. So you know what? Here's, here's something. I see you guys are kind of answering each other's uh, comments. I see that you guys are really talking amongst yourself, which would make sense because we can't get to them all. Um, so here's, here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. I see a lot of comments of people being, being very confident in certain answers that they're giving. And some of those answers, I can tell you from reading the Bible, just aren't true. It's just you guys are actually giving each other answers that just aren't true. Now, I'm not saying don't give the answers to each other. But what I'm saying is, is that please, if you've, if you've read the Bible before, you believe you know the Bible, and let's say you stuttered, studied some of the great, the great uh, theologians of our day. Let's say you've studied all of John Piper and John MacArthur's books, okay? And you guys have memorized every kind of scientific breakdown on YouTube videos and blogs. And you, you watch somebody who just made absolute sense of, of, for instance, let's say the timeline of Genesis or the timeline of Revelations or whatever it is that we come into. Let me encourage you. While I, I'm, I'm welcoming, me and Alex are welcoming you guys to share the answers that you have. Let me welcome you guys to also, though, be open to the fact that maybe everything you've ever heard might actually be wrong. Let me, let me encourage you to make it possible in your mind as you read the Bible that everything you have maybe even studied up until this very day, you might learn something new today, like me and Alex did today, that God could speak to you and it will revolutionize everything you think you know about the Bible. Just one part of the Bible opened up to you with a new truth can change the entire Bible in being like, like I said, it goes from being, you know, uh, old box with a knob TV going all the way to HD. It just makes everything more clear. It doesn't mean that the truth you had before isn't necessarily true. It just means that you become, you walk into a new form of clarity of understanding of revelation of, of God and the Bible and everything that's in it. You get what I mean? So let me just encourage you. I'm not saying don't share. I'm not saying don't do this and that. But, but instead of being somebody who's coming with answers, which me and Alex are not trying to do. You see, we're not trying to come and just give you answers because there's tons of that on the Internet. The most important thing that we believe here is that when you read the Bible, you will have revelation and you will have an experience. And if you go in with too much information going in your ears, the information coming to your eyes as you're reading the words will be missed because your ears will override what your eyes see. Hearing is actually an override of all senses. The reason is, is because it's where, where we sense danger. You know, it's where we, if, if somebody is speaking, we're at, it's second to actually hearing, which is why actually in the movie industry, which me and Alex both come from, sound is actually more important than quality of video. That is a rule because the human ear overrides all other senses. Hearing is more important. And what I'm saying is, is that if you are listening to all the stuff that's ever come into your head and you're listening to that little voice in your head while you're reading the Bible, you could actually be missing everything your eyes are reading. So let me just encourage everybody who's participating in this Bible read through, especially if you're seasoned, especially if you're educated, try your best to say maybe everything I think I know no matter how convinced you are of that information, maybe everything I think I know might be wrong. Read the Bible with that kind of open-mindedness, and you might actually get new revelation. Mm. Okay? Amen. I, All right. I agree with that. There's a question uh, up, above, yeah. Yeah, up above about uh, Shana. You think you were asking about Enoch? Did he die or what happened there? No, the Bible clearly states that he did not die. He got translated. He's one of the only two characters in the story that... For, for whom that happens, Elijah mm -hmm. being the second one later. So, um, and it says, I think you said uh, God walked with Enoch. I think maybe it says Enoch walked with God, which which actually may be uh, referring to Enoch walked in the ways of God. Mm -hmm. Anthony Dunmore says Satan uses the same trick over and over again. You know the one he used with Eve. Did God really say that? <laughs> Meditate on the words so you know exactly what he said. Anthony, that is a very good word of advice, sir. I could not agree with you more. In fact, I call that thing that he did to Eve being Eved. Uh, I've actually used it in other videos where Satan actually says a true statement, 
but leaves off an important part and then tricks your mind into going, well, what Satan is saying is true. So what he's meaning by what he's saying must be true. And that is being eaved. Satan knows the gospel better than any of us ever will. He, uh, he doesn't know it as good as Yeshua, though, obviously. He doesn't even at least under have the understanding that Yeshua had. Um, and uh, Satan will actually use some truth, some truth to lie to us. And, uh, you know, they say the best liars are people who build their lies on truth, right? So Satan is the, is the master and the father of lies, as the Bible says. So good comment, buddy. Do you get the books in Hebrew and Greek? Well, Sheila, so anybody asking about how we read the Bible in, in the other languages, we use an app called e-sword.net. We have absolutely no affiliation with them. It's a free app for Android and Amazon. Only charges like $2 or $3 for those of you who have uh, Apple products. Um, and it allows you to have the Strong's Concordance for free. And what a Strong's Concordance is, is that every time you mouse over a word, it will give you the original Hebrew, Greek, or Latin word, or Aramaic word that it was actually written in. And so you can actually see both the original word, what the original word was used for, the other references in the Bible when it was used, and so on and so forth. And also, just so you guys know, there's a rule in, uh, in, in the Hebrew culture or in the Jewish culture when studying the Bible. It's called um, the rule of first time use. I can't remember the exact term it's called, but it's basically the rule of first time used. The first time a word is used in the Bible is the actual absolute appropriate way for it to be used, and it will tell you what the word means. So that's a really important thing. If you ever want to know for sure what the use of a word is or what the point of a word is, always go to the first time it's used in the Bible. Look for the first time it's mentioned in the Bible and how it's used at that instance is its greatest truth of the word used, okay? So, and, and, it's, and its purpose of, its, of the word's existence. Really important thing. You know about that, yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, Okay, Renee, you say, if we say something incorrect, please point out the correct understanding. Renee, the reason why we don't want to do that is because then you're listening to two guys. And you could be listening to another person on, on the comment. You could be listening to a guy on YouTube. You could be listening to a guy on a blog. If, if we sit here and we just say, oh, that's wrong, now what we're going to have is another guy or another person, a girl who shows up and says, oh, no, but it's right. But I mean this, but I mean that. And it becomes a debate. The point that Alex and I are trying to make with this read through and why we're not reading it for you and telling you what it means is because we believe that every question you have and every misunderstanding that exists will actually be clarified by reading the Bible for yourself. So you can't trust what me and Alex say. You can't trust what anybody who's commenting here on this video or any video we make in the future. You can't trust what they say. You can't trust what somebody on YouTube says or even somebody on TM, TM, what is it? Uh, TBN or you know, the Sunrise Network or any Christian network. You can't trust anybody. You can't trust us. You can't trust anybody. There is only one source of knowledge and information that you can trust, and that is the Bible. And we believe that there is no question that you will have that God will not answer with the Bible. I really believe that. So what that is code for, if I may say, what that is actually code for is that the Bible's literal meaning, as it jumps at you from the page, if you don't understand it or you don't like it, mm -hmm. you may just be resisting it. Just simply accept the literal meaning of what it is saying. Mm -hmm. And if there's gaps in there, the gaps are on purpose. Yes. The gaps are on purpose to be explained later. Yes. So if we explain to you what we believe the answer to a gap may be, uh, we, we are robbing you mm -hmm. of so much by doing that. Yeah. So we don't want to do that. Yeah, and most of all, we're, ro we're robbing you of the experience, you guys. The experience of the Bible is, in fact, an experience. And, and here's the thing. If we put in a nugget in your brain, which obviously thousands of people up until this day of your life, no matter how old you are, thousands of people up until this very moment of us having this video fellowship have already put nuggets in your brain. And that is why it's hard for you to actually read the Bible. It's because those nuggets contradict what the Bible says. It's because those nuggets are pre-educated lies or, or confusions or twists. And so when you read the scripture, you're reading it with those nuggets filtering the knowledge which you're reading. I know, I experienced it this morning. 
Alex experienced it before. We, we, we have had this happen to us even now, even after reading the Bible multiple times. So the Lord will use this read through that we're doing here together to get us all through it. And the Lord will allow us the opportunity to witness with each other, fellowship with each other and get through this. We won't, we don't want to just correct you. We want the Bible to correct us all. And we believe that by reading it, it will, it will come to be that way. I see you guys are sharing the eSword link. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you so much. I know you guys, I've, I've said it before, we'll be, we'll be sharing that again. Uh, I may not be able to answer all, but you are definitely teaching each of us to learn to read the Bible on our own and trust the word and answer in there 100% truth. That alone gives me hope and motivation. Read the Bible. Woohoo. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Honestly, Hallelujah. that's it. That's all we want to do. That is all we want to do. Because if we thought that we could translate the Bible to you, each and every one of you, the perfect, absolute way it's supposed to be translated, we would be the largest egomaniacs in the world. Yeah, we'd start a cult or some giant church. Some crazy thing. But in reality, don't do that. So, But the thing is, is that we believe that God is living and real. We believe the Holy Spirit is right here on earth with each and every single one of us who receive it. And that the Holy Spirit will give understanding as is prophesied it will do in the new testament so when you read the bible it will speak to you exactly how you are meant to hear it and as we fellowship together our fellowship will help fill in the blanks and help us all grow do you see what i mean like i'm so glad you guys are getting this i'm so glad that this first video of course it's birth pains guys it's birth pains this first video is a little rough we had sound issues in the beginning. You know, we're trying to catch up to your, your comments, you know, everything like that. But we're, this is the template. And by the time we get to the end of the Bible reading together, imagine how pro this fellowship, online fellowship is going to be. It's going to be amazing. I know it will be. All right, let's get back to your questions. The two witnesses. Okay, you guys are asking some questions that are not through Genesis 1 through 10. <laughs> hold, hold on to those questions for us. I love it. We want a fellowship. But if, if we jump ahead all over, there's no reason for us to read the Bible together and talk about it together. Let's just stick within 1 through 10 of Genesis on this video. Next video, by the way, is going to be 11 through 20. Okay, so that'll be the next video. Uh, Jennifer Connolly, trust no man or me or anyone investigate it for yourself. This is custom. Uh, it's designed just for you. God loves you. He knows you. It's time. If it's time... It's in his time. Oh, that's good. I like that. That's real good. Uh, yeah. Ando. Classic example is John 5, 46 to 47, unlearned taught, taught, taught lies. What about Adam and Eve? Well, I don't know what you're asking. Personal revelation. Next session. Great time. Subject Genesis 10 through 11. So, okay. David, you're asking, what's the, when is the next session and what, are we'll, what will we be discussing next Sunday? Yeah, same, same bat time channel. It's pretty much the same times right here um, on uh, Yeshua Network. Uh, and we will be going through 11 through 20. So, uh, Jeff is asking, please read through all of our comments after the video is over. And please try to answer them in later videos if at all possible. We, we will try to do that for sure, yeah. Jeff. We Good. will try to do that. Thank you, Jeff. That's actually a really great uh, suggestion. We will actually try to do that. Even though already there are 768 comments, granted some of them are repeats, but we will try to go through them and, and see the ones that we feel comfortable asking, and we will. Yeah. Thanks, Ronica. You like my sense of humor. <laughs> Where's that? Oh. <laughs> Where? Haha. Uh, -ha. Love the Get a Church. Oh, Get a Church. Oh, gotcha, Sorry. gotcha. Uh, Ryan, Truth Me Free. Yes, Truth Me Free is my other ministry uh, page. It is uh, facebook.com forward slash truth me free and YouTube forward slash truth me free. It's, uh, it's just the original ministry that God gave me, uh, which led to all this happening. Yeah. Is there a group or will this be on Facebook? It'll be here on this page. Yes. Every, every Sunday we will try to do Every it. Sunday we'll be here at the Yeshua Network. We want this to reach the largest audience possible out of the three ministry pages, uh, hashtag Be The Light, Truth Me Free, and Yeshua Network. Yeshua Network obviously has the largest uh, reach of people, and we believe that every single person who calls himself a believer or follower of Christ or a Christian or whatever, a Jew, it doesn't matter. If you are believing anything that comes from the Bible, it is our absolute conviction that you should have read or you should read the entire Bible for yourself. So we want to have as many people follow us on this read through as possible. Um, 
did God give Noah a new authority in 9-2? Well, we're not there yet, right? Oh, nine, or Genesis oh, 9. Oh, 9. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we are. We are there. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, he basically created a new covenant with Noah to a degree, especially when everything got washed away in the rain. Uh, Noah was supposed to, you know, share the truth and the knowledge that he has with his kids, but also there was a dilution of power, God's power. Um, as the Bible reads there in the uh, eights and the nines of Genesis, the earth was tainted with man's evil and the bloodshed. So God had to wash the earth clean. That was the reason for the flood. You'll notice that too. I don't know if anybody picked that up, that the reason for the flood wasn't just to kill human beings. Like God wasn't just using it as a giant form of uh, mass murder. It was the purpose of the flood was actually to wash the earth, which had become filled with man's evil or the evil of the watchers and the so forth. So, um, and the fallen angels and the Nephilim and things like that. They had just gotten so evil that God said they were literally born evil and they had no other sense about them other than to do evil. So that is a really intense uh, statement there. I mean, it's basically, you know, how we might imagine an alligator or something. When you think of evil continually. Yeah, evil continually. continually. Every yeah. thought is evil and sinful. Every thought. Yeah, every thought. It's pretty bad. Yeah. If Adam was formed from the dust of the earth, would it be safe to say that pretty much all the images of Adam and Eve, even in biblical documentaries to paintings, are false? Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the paintings that we have came from basically the... Uh, the uh, Renaissance, Renaissance era. era, which is uh, not, they're not going to be, no, they're not going to look like that. They're not going to look like people from the Renaissance era, most likely. So, good comment. Uh, let's see. That was kind of there. Oh, okay. Uh, Jeff, thank you for the shot out about TMF. I really appreciate it. Let's see. Uh, click the follow yeah. or Lisa's page. Join the long word. Were animals unafraid before the flood? Huh. That's a, that's a good question. That's that's an interesting question. It is an interesting um, question. There is a part of Genesis right at the beginning where there's some animals described. Obviously, the animals in the garden are described as animals that were able to communicate with Adam. So I think it's important to know. Uh, this goes back to the whole general theme of Genesis. It is a world far different than the world we live in, yeah. but a world that we seem to constantly imagine in every bit of fantasy we write, yeah. in every bit of science fiction we write. It is almost like as if we know this. The, the, these ideas are not our own. They didn't come from something we just came yeah. up with. They actually come from, hey, the Bible. So the world, pre-flood world, I think it's fair to say, was so mind-blowing. And magical. And magical. And yet, I think many people who are dreamers, like ourselves, like I'm sure all the rest of you are, long for a world like that. Mm -hmm. That's why we love Harry Potter. That's why we go to Lord of the Rings and things like that. Because and Jedi's we, who can move rocks Jedi's. with their minds and That's things right. like that. Yeah. We long for that world, and yet we have we shouldn't. You you would think it would be unnatural for us to long for a world like that, because look at our world today. Look at our lives today. We can't move rocks with our minds. If there's any one of you who can, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine moving your imagine moving a mountain with your faith, or having a tree uproot based on your faith. And it and actually roots in some other place or throws itself in the lake. I mean, I mean that would put a Jedi to shame. I mean, <laughs> no Jedi actually made a tree uproot by itself and walk. I mean, <laughs> as amazing as any Jedi movie or Harry Potter movie is, in real life, if y if you saw a man tell a tree to die and in a very instant it goes and withers and dies, you'd probably poopoo -poo your pants in all reality. You'd probably be like. Bro, what did you just do, right? I mean, you freak out. So, but that's the Bible. That's New Testament too. But in the Old Testament, you know, there was a relationship. And there is something that I want to mention because Patrick and a couple of other people have mentioned this. So if you guys, if a lot of you mention it, then I think it's something we should talk about. So Patrick says, we're animals unafraid in the flood. You're talking about animals. Pay attention to just one thing. If you guys go back and read Genesis 1 through 10 again, specifically, I think it's more like 1 through 2. Uh, you're going to see the part where it talks about animals, the creation of animals. You will see that there was a creation of animals before man was made. Then you're going to see Adam was made and then animals were made. Some of you might be thinking to yourself, is that a contradiction? In the beginning part of the Bible, God says animals were made, then man. Then God created Adam and then animals. God doesn't contradict himself. So there's something to that. 
and I don't want to confuse you on it, but let's just roll with this one thing I want to point out. There were beasts of the earth that were created in the first part. Then afterwards, if you take a look at the animals that were created after Adam himself was created, they were farm animals. They were cattle. They were sheep. They were animals that he was able to uh, use and have relationship with. I don't think that obviously a alligator or a gorilla or a dinosaur or anything like that would have been animals that Adam would have been able to have relationship with. So I think it's important for us to also realize science has proven that sheep cannot live in nature without mankind. Now here's what's crazy. Adam was created, then the Bible says that God created animals that Adam was supposed to have dominion over. He was supposed to care for them and watch over them. Could that have been a second set of animals that we today call domesticated? Animals that for some reason, even though they outweigh us by a thousand freaking pounds, <laughs> we have the ability to actually control them and use them and utilize them from a horse to a bull to a cow to a sheep to a ram to a, to a goat, you know, to dogs and cats. You know, it's amazing how there are actual animals that are domesticated that we relate with. And that actually matches scripture because Adam was born, then another form of animals were created. And for those of you who asked the question earlier about what about dinosaurs? Are they in the Bible? I believe absolutely dinosaurs are in the Bible. They are on earth and God created the earth and the beast on the earth. So if there's a dinosaur bone in the ground, where did they come from if God didn't create them? But you might ask, well, Nathan, where are these animals mentioned in the Bible? Well, before Adam was created, there were a slew of animals that were created before Adam. And then Adam arrives and then he has relationship with a special set of animals. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Go back and read it for yourself is all, all I'm saying. Go back and read it for yourself and see if this jumps out of the page to you, what we just mentioned, okay? It even says in Genesis 1, it talks, the word monsters is used. Monsters, yeah. So pre, on the day that God created all the creatures of the sea and the, and the, and the land, there was, there was mention of giant monster-like creatures. Yeah. Well, what is a dinosaur if not a giant monster? Yeah, if I were to see a dinosaur in real life and I was a kid, I would obviously think it was a giant monster, right? Especially <laughs> with the fangs and the drool if it was the T-Rex. and You know what I mean? I'd be freaking out and I'd be calling it a monster. Now, you talk about like a Brontosaurus or something, which is supposed to be this, this super, super giant animal, but it's friendly and gentle, we think, because it eats plants. I would obviously still think that was a monster if I saw it the first time. I, I would still probably run away from the Brontosaurus, especially as the size of like, what, three high, like school buses? I'm not going near that thing, you know? <laughs> so yeah, just something, to, just something for you guys to go back and reread and pay attention to. Because like I'm saying, you may have missed that. And the reason why your brain may have missed that detail is because of preconceived notions or understanding of the Bible, pre-educated taught lessons from John Piper, John MacArthur, your pastor, theologians from the Renaissance era and the Enlightenment era. There's so much stuff that we have actually been passed down through the generations. People have actually told us what to believe and what to understand about the Bible. I don't know if you guys know this, but the reason why the book of the Catechism was invented was because it was said that the average human, the normal human, could not understand God's word. They could not read it and they could not understand it because they were too simple-minded. They needed somebody to explain it to them. Therefore, they created a second book that's called the Catechism. So think about that. That was at the Council of Nicaea in 364 AD. We were almost exactly 2,000 years later and we have had the same mindset from our spiritual fathers over the last 2,000 years of them believing that us, the average person, somehow, some way are unreachable by the Holy Spirit, unreachable by God's knowledge and, and able to give us life directly from the living word. And that's an insult to God's word. That's an insult to the living, breathing word of God. That is an insult to the sentence, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word of God. It doesn't say the smart man or the chosen holy righteous man shall live not on bread alone, but by every word of God. It says man, all people, all people. And so we need to undo this education. So just read that first part and see, see how much your mind may be missed. I'll do this one and this one is definitely Yeah, for go you. for it. Uh, real quick, uh, Anthony Dunmore says, dinosaurs is a word that was invented in around 19, uh, 1845. 
Before that, dinosaurs were called oh, dragons. dragons. Dragons are mentioned in the Bible. So, bam. Yep. Kudos, Anthony. That's exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> getting a little head, though, Anthony. I like it, but you're getting a little <laughs> head. So, Anthony, hold that one. Hold that one. And when the video comes where, where the passages we read mentions dragon, I'm asking you, be there with us on that video and throw that in there. Go, did you guys notice passage blah, blah, blah mentions dragons, okay? So bring that back because there's going to be more people with us on that video too. Yeah. Um, this one's definitely for you. The tree of life is God. It's an allegory. Well, maybe. That, I believe that is partially true, but let's see what the scriptures say about it as we continue to read. Let's see. Okay, Gerard actually asks a really good question. He says, what purpose did the dinosaurs have? Everything has one purpose, really, for God's glory. God made it, and he saw it was good. To glorify, to glorify his creation, yeah. his immense power. Yep. <clears throat> what is more magnificent than a giant dinosaur? I mean, outside of us being afraid of him eating us, right? If we could just... When you go to see Jurassic Park, why does it move you? Because these giant creatures are so overwhelmingly yeah. giant. <laughs> Rob, you have a great comment. I, and the way you word it is really great. So I'm going to quote you on this because I, I like how you said it. Careful and discretionary reading is of the utmost when reading the spirit and truth. Absolutely. You, hit, yeah. you said that very well. Thank you, sir. Okay. Let's see. Okay, Irene KD, does day that God took for his work would equal to today's length of day? So let's talk about that because that's in these passages. So let's go ahead and talk about that. It would not. The reason why we know that is if this, the, we, our day is a consistent of the world spinning facing the sun and our light source is the sun. So one rotation of the earth spin would be our day. But if the sun was not created yet, right, how can there be a day like that? And if the sun is not created yet and there's just a light of gas in, in, in the sky, everywhere in the sky, how long did that gas stay lit until it cooled and became a star? That would have been when it shrank down and there would have been the first night. So imagine the very first night would have looked like this, you guys. If we're talking about the creation, go back and read. Genesis 1 again, and, and watch what the Bible says. It says, there was a light in the sky. No form, just light. He says he does not create the sun and moon until later days. So this, there was a light in the sky, and we know that according to science, which I believe actually testifies of God and matches with the Bible. That's my belief based upon what I'm about to tell you and what I've studied. If that gas in the sky were to have over a billion years eventually compacted to itself, crunched down and created a star, the first time that that star had reached a small enough point to be eclipsed by the earth itself, right? That is when you would have had the first full night. That was day one. How long did it take for light to be a given birth? The gas is there, it crunches down, turns into a ball, which is able to be eclipsed by the rotation of the, of the earth and have your first full night. How long would that have taken? That was God's first day. That is a time period, not a day in which we understand it. And God defines what is a day. He says, from the day the, the night went night, and uh, from the light went dark, to the light come back again. That's a day. And also, you know, just using what we've heard or seem to understand from what scientists have told us about the nature of the universe and where the earth fits in and how the how sunlight works and where you know all of that stuff if we even take that out if we just look at the literal what what the bible is literally saying it's literally saying that uh there was light and then there was darkness but there was a morning and an evening and most of us go well how can there be a morning and an evening without the sun and the rotating earth no the morning and the evening can simply literally be fade ins fade outs right Probably one of the most jarring things you can imagine is when the lights go off just like this. In every theater you go to, before the movie starts, there's a fade out and a fade in of light. Because, you know, so basically we don't need for there to be a sun and a moon and even an earth for there to be a morning and an evening. It's just a fade in and fade out of light. Um, and then, it, you know, the way I was interpreting it somewhat is that the creation of that sun and that moon or the 
created sort of an automated process where, okay, now this just sort of happens. Got to put it into motion, and this sort of happens for us now. Mm -hmm. We have a morning, evening, sun right. and moon, night and day. We have a cycle. We have a cycle, right. and maybe for him the cycle simply was, I look upon my creation, there's light. I go back and rest, and there isn't light. What if that was it? Yeah, we or don't know. We don't know. But we do know that his definition is a point from where light is light, and the experiences that the light fades, that is a day. And that does not mean a rotation of the earth with the sun, because the sun was not created yet. So we cannot say how long that is according to earth rotational, solar rotational. You see what I'm saying? Tony, you say, I don't think you are the real Yeshua. Tony, I'm very glad you made that comment. I couldn't agree with you more. We are definitely not the real Yeshua. My name is Nathan Wheeler, and this is Alex, and neither of us call each other Yeshua. This is the Yeshua Network. Uh, we name it after Yeshua because he told me to name it after him. He told me that uh, the use of his real name was important, and uh, it's called a network because we network and we fellowship and we bring you certain kind of media and content. So thank you very much, Tony, for clarifying and making sure that everybody on this page understood that I am not Yeshua and Matt is not Yeshua and we are not Yeshua. Thank you so much. But we love Yeshua. But we love Yeshua. And thus, this page is dedicated solely to him. Why does God say, let us make human beings in our image? Who is we? Well, Amy, we're going to find that out as we continue to read the Bible. Where Adam and Eve, the first people created, what people are referred to in 2 Peter 3, 6. So, is that, is that a later book, yeah. New Testament book? Well, where Adam <coughs> and Eve, first people created, what people are created in 1 Peter 3, 6. Are so, referred to, yeah. Yeah, so, um, let's get there. Let's get to 2 Peter uh, together, and, and we will actually talk about that when we get there. And trust me, when we get there, we will be talking about it, because when we get to that point... We're going to be able to actually go into detail and recap and talk about the scriptures and we'll bounce back and forth. But let us not get ahead of ourselves. Let's experience where we are at right now. And right now we're at creation, the absolute beginning of creation and the magic of the world and people living a thousand years and, and um, you know, things like that. Let's, 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 let's keep on that. Um, when God made Adam from the dirt of the ground, a pejorative sense is explicated. Since the ground was, has since the ground has all these amazing nutrients, does the Hebrew hint to a more positive take on things? I, I would agree 100% with that, Anthony. I would say so, because I, I would say that the original bodies also lived a lot longer. Uh, they were healthier. They understood that they, uh, you know, there was just, they, they had a special connection with the earth as well, and the plants and the animals. Right, uh, so I would say that it's symbolic, and 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 literal. John is John Otto says, "How is it that God said, let's create man, then later He made them? Can you explain the difference, please?" Uh, All right, let's do it. Go ahead. Okay. All right. All right. Hold on. So we're going to talk about something that's kind of mind jolting here, and some of you may not be able to swallow this. Trust me, I understand. So, Alex. I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. Answer the man's question for right. him about how is it, if you guys don't understand the question, when you're reading through Genesis, you're going to notice that on the sixth day, God created man after he created animals. He's going to create man and woman, man, man, male and female, right? Then he rests. Then he creates Adam and Eve, and then he creates more animals in which they are to associate with. Is he talking about the same man and female? When he says it in the first six, seven days being described, me and Alex are under the understanding it can't because if he is, the time frame and the order is contradicting and the God would not contradict himself. So go ahead and reread re okay. his, but I just want to be clear on what the question and what the topic so is we're talking about. We're talking about the end of Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2. Two. Something that hit me this morning while reviewing it before our talk, and everybody, so many people are asking about it, and yeah. it's telling me, it's confirming within yes. me that the reason why I hit upon this and I was given this revelation is specifically because all of us are onto this question. Yes. And here's the question. In day, on day six, it says that God created man in his form and image, made them both male and female, and basically blessed them and told them, go multiply and have dominion over the earth. Right. Okay. Then he rests on day seven, then no, notice he also says over the earth not over the garden that's right there is no garden yet no garden yet. then he rests on day seven and then he goes and creates a garden a 
garden. He also says that the earth does not yet have not has not yet had rain, and there's no uh, farming style planting yet. Correct. He cre he's the first farmer. He creates the first garden. He creates. God creates the first garden, not man. Go ahead. Then, that out. then God creates Adam, and he makes him head of the garden. And now how does he create Adam? He creates him from dust and then breathes his own. God, God's spirit is breathed through Adam and gives him his spirit, right? His gives spirit. him life. Life. So A special, he's the only being ever created where God actually breathed his personal life into the being. Adam is the first one to have God's essence in him and was made like him. Keep going. Exactly. Then, uh, in order to, he saw that Adam was there by himself with a whole bunch of plants, so he gave him special, these special animals that Adam could actually talk to. Now, right. we actually, or at least I actually interpret that as literally talk to. Like yeah. he could talk, these animals, because this, the serpent later talks to Adam and Eve, so he could literally talk to them. But even if you didn't want to go that far, you could say, well, yes, the domesticated animals, when you talk to your dog, he listens and understands and you. And he does. So, okay. And even farm animals. You can speak to a farm animal and a farm animal will listen. And they also can get a little attitude with you. They have personalities, you guys. Anybody who's on a farm or a ranch, you know your animals know what the heck you're saying. Exactly. Matches scripture completely. So, uh, now the order now is obviously different than Genesis 1. And it seems to be following after day 7. So all of initial creations already happened. Now this is a special creation. Right. God creates the garden. He creates Adam. He gives him special animals. Creates those. Adam starts naming them. Adam is lonely. So God says, all right, I will create you a wife. And he does it out of Adam. By the way, Adam has 24 ribs. Uh, or, I'm sorry, man has 24 ribs. He says he took a rib out of Adam. It's interesting to know that human beings have 23 chromosomes. Do we truly understand the word rib? Is it referring to the rib, the spine of our DNA? I don't know. I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Total uh, rabbit Symbolism. hole. Rabbit but hole. A, but an interesting Good going, Alex. Telling him sorry. to stay away from the rabbit holes. Do you guys see exactly why I tell you stay away from the rabbit holes? Do you see how this can get you? Just so, that, so he's uh, right where you guys are at. <laughs> just and this is why I'm saying don't do this. Don't do the rabbit holes. holes. Uh, just interesting symbolism. That's all it we're is. It okay, is an so, interesting symbol. So it creates e Eve. Eve is now, just like Adam, uh, uh, a daughter of God's spirit. This is what I'm getting at. So all the stuff that happens in the garden happens in the garden. The serpent deceives them. They're, they are. Why does God say, "Well, you, you know, you're not just like every other"? In my, this is my, this is me. This is my interpretation. You're just not like every other human being that has been created already. You are special. I gave you the breath of my life. I gave you the tree of life. I, you can live eternally here with me, mm -hmm. and yet you broke our covenant. So I will give you what you want. He sends them out into the world. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Later on, um, now now moving really quickly. Later on, we see a lot of people. A lot, you know. Let me jump in because you go got ahead. off a topic real go quick. Ahead, go ahead. So you guys, the one thing I want to interrupt Alex on is this: is that we're talking specifically about the animals. We're talking specifically about Adam and Eve and the first humans. Okay. Reason why we want to answer this now is because this is the part of the Bible we're in. Okay. That's why we're bringing this topic up and we are bringing this clarity. This is part of the fellowship that that we want to have with you. We're not telling you what to believe. We're telling you to just pay attention. And we want to always stand on the fact that God does not contradict himself. Okay? So when God said that he first created animals and beasts and monsters, then created male and female humans, right? Then he rested on the seventh day. Then he created Adam in a very special way, breathed life into dust. Then he created Eve again in a very special way. He took it from Adam who held that special breath of life from God. Then God created them a special group of animals to relate and fellowship and work with them in the garden, a specific place on earth, right? So the garden was a separate place set aside where farming and ranching was the first place and God did it first, taught Adam how to do it. Then Adam made a name for all the animals, talked with all the animals, and then they get kicked out of the garden because they did what God prophesied they would do. See, God said, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge because when you do, you will surely die. Notice he didn't say if you do. He said when you do. He prophesied that it would happen. The other thing to realize is God is sovereign, which means that the devil could not have tempted Eve without God's permission. 
So God pretends that he doesn't know. It's something I call control folly, which we will see throughout the Bible. I'll be talking about controlled folly as we come into it. But this is God's first controlled folly when he pretends that he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are in the garden. Why does he pretend? Because it causes them to be forced into a situation where they get to tell the first lie themselves or they tell the truth. Now, here's something very interesting about Adam. When God says, where are you? He says, I'm hiding because I'm ashamed. He doesn't lie. Then he says, why are you ashamed? Did you eat of the tree of the fruit of knowledge? And he says, I ate the thing that Eve gave to me. And Eve says, well, I ate it because the serpent beguiled me and tricked me into eating it. So again, Adam is not lying at this moment. So Adam's sin at this moment was simply that he ate the fruit what he wasn't supposed to eat, but he didn't lie. He wasn't making a conscious choice to deceive God and break the covenant, which is why he showed a little grace on, you, on, on Adam. Do you get what I mean? And that's an important part. And that's why God used controlled folly in this moment when he pretended that he could not see where they were hiding. Okay, he wanted to give them the opportunity to sin one more time, and were they going to be liars themselves? But they didn't. They said the truth. And I believe that that's why he showed grace on them and allowed them out of the garden. Do you see what I mean? So, uh, but all these things are, are tied into the first males. Now, here's a question you guys all have, and this is how I want to end this particular conversation. So I'm going to add many one more people, thing. Yeah, you, you can. Well, but many people ask, where did the other people come from? Well, the other people... As the Bible says, they didn't have the spirit of God and the relationship with God as Adam and Eve and their descendants have, right? So those other people, if you read the Bible this way that we're talking about, they would have been the people who were actually made before Adam and Eve, but they didn't have God's special anointing and breath of life in them. So you could argue maybe, can I say it, that they were like Neanderthals or they were lower-minded people. You could argue that. Okay, so those were the first humanoids, and then there was the modern human who has like God's special spirit in them because they did come in a later time. That's definitely one way you can look at it. You can try to explain why we see human like creatures uh, that share, we, ha we seem to share DNA with as well. But one thing I want to say also is that it doesn't necessarily have to mean that they were a different quote species. Mm -hmm. They may have been literally people just like every, they were the flesh of human beings. But Adam was the first spiritual child of God. Now, here's the point. If you trace to Noah, it says Noah was perfect in his generations leading back to Adam. So Adam. Noah is a descendant of Adam, the perfect child of God. Through Shem. And, through, and Shem following him, and then everybody through until Yeshua, yep. who was also traces his lineage all the way back to Adam. So the flesh part of Yeshua goes all the way back to Adam. But if, if the earth was flooded and destroyed and all, all flesh was destroyed and started anew with Noah, that means we all trace ourselves back to Noah, which means when people literally say, you are God's children, mm -hmm. that is literally what that means. And Irene even comments on it. She says, hmm, if Adam was the only person with God's spirit and Eve came out of Adam, that means that every of their children and next generation... Uh, have that God spirit and the Bible agrees with that statement Irene Bible says that God put his spirit in every single soul that is tied to the lineage of Adam Noah Adam Abraham everybody who comes through that lineage has God's spirit in it and that is where we are able to connect and know who Yeshua is because that spirit resonates and and that's how we that's how we are able to know who he is yeah so the flesh of human beings can be far older than the spirit, than those of us now that walk with the spirit of God within us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, what, I'm, what I just said? Mm -hmm. Want to say it again? That the flesh of humanity yeah. may be older than Adam. Or the, or the physical look. The physical look, the physical right. flesh, all of that stuff. But, yeah. the, but the spirituality of humanity is born with Adam. And, and that relation, that, and that spiritual... That need to relate let's just to God. Say, let's just say soul. Can we just, you yeah. guys understand when we say that, that we have a special soul, not to say that animals don't have a soul, but we have a special soul and a special spirit that connects us directly to God. We are able to fathom and comprehend God. As he said, we would be like him in our understanding, our comprehension, our, our, our image. Now, the actual Hebrew definition of that word where it says we will make man in our image is not an actual real good translation. The actual translation says we will make man in our overseeing. We will make man in our outline. Our, our general idea of what we look like, like a shadow, 
okay? Not like the face and the freckles and the zits and the hair and the beard and the teeth, like none of that. The word that was used in Hebrew was like the general outline or the general overcast, the mold, if you will. And so that is what's very interesting about when you say made in God's image, it's not really meaning the word image as we think it is. It's a, that is actually a mistranslation in English. So that's another reason why I say read the original Hebrew or, and so forth and other languages. Yep. Without God, we could not move, breathe. Amen. Got better? Oh, it did? The volume got better? Wow, weird. I don't know what's going on. Maybe my computer's tripping, you guys. I apologize. I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, oh, Daniel jumping ahead. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So, Daniel, hold on to that, and let's bring that up on the next video. You're talking about Gen uh, First Corinthians, or not next video, but First Corinthians 15, 45. And so it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a living, giving spirit. So, uh, yeah, that's something that we would definitely talk about when we get to 1 Corinthians in our read-through. So Lisa asks, so there are people who are not of God's spirit now? And the answer is technically is no. no. And here's why. Because of the flood. Because of the flood. It was wiped clean, and Noah was, was, was the one that traces his lineage. He says, literally says he was perfect in his generations. So it means two things. One, he wasn't tainted by the watchers and had all the Nephilim stuff and all of the right. experiments that happened in Genesis 6. Mm -hmm. And two, he traces his lineage back to God's first, like, spiritual man, right. Adam. Yeah. So, so if you guys are confused, there were humans-ish beings. Human, let's just call them human beings without that inner spirit connection to God that were created. They were on earth. But God set aside a little portion of earth he calls the garden. And the garden was like this perfect blissful kind of place, right? A paradise kind of movie idea kind of place. And in this garden, there were special animals that God created for a special human being that he created and he put his literal spirit in this being. He didn't create it from the other flesh so that it had no ge genealogical connections to it. He, Adam did not come like a descendant like science says, where we are from monkeys who turned Neanderthal, who turned human. God says there are humanoids that I created, male and female versions of them. But there was a special kind of human named Adam that I breathe life into directly. Can you guys hear Nathan well? I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure. Oh, well, I am moving in the court. Okay, let me see. Hopefully, is that better? So, I move my microphone so back. Okay, well, I'll try to stay still. Um, so Adam has a special spirit in him that then Eve is pulled from Adam so that the spirit is transferred. He's basically cloned, really, right? So that spirit is transferred, the DNA is transferred, the promise, the, the blessing is transferred, and then those humans are in a direct line. Now, when Cain says that if he goes out into the world, the other people are going to kill him. And many people have asked, who are these other people? And many times I've even said they were like probably his brothers and sisters that aren't mentioned in the Bible. I believe I was wrong. I believe, and I said I believed, I didn't know. Now, understanding what, what we've read today in the Bible, what uh, Alex has uh, been revealed, what some of you already know, there were other humans, but they did not have the special blessing of God's spirit in them. Now, this matches with scripture as you continue to read, because God says there were other beings on earth and they were in pure evil. He says that their thoughts, their actions were nothing but selfishness, murderous thoughts, rapage thoughts, like horrible thoughts. And he says that the blood had been, or the earth had been tainted by the blood they spilled and the evil they had done. And only one family had remained pure to the bloodline of Adam. So that tells us, you guys, that tells us that the brothers and sisters or the other people that they were having sex with and marrying and Cain was scared was gonna kill him was not his brothers and sisters because that would have been a very pure bloodline. It means that there were another form of human being on earth and that only Noah had kept his bloodline pure directly to Adam and Eve. And that was why he was the one who was chosen to enter the ark and all other life was killed on earth. That's biblical. So you guys can read through those again, one through 10, and you will actually see how it says that. So pretty and interesting stuff. And it's interesting to note if that if we're actually right right now and we've, our interpretation is correct mm -hmm. and that other people that let's say 
Once Cain is, is banished, he cries out, oh, they're going to kill me. And God right. says, they will not touch you. And I will put a sign that will make sure that they don't touch you. He takes a wife. And, and like Nathan's saying, was his wife a sister? Because that could be the only option if only Adam and Eve are, are the only humans on earth. Yeah. So, and the answer is... Or if, a cousin we, or niece or, or nephew. Cousin, yeah, if we're correct, then the answer is no. It could have been one of the other humans. And what does that mean? That means that God is saying the other humans are not like cut off from my people and my salvation and relationship with me. They just don't have that. They don't that, receive him, though. They don't have that head start. They yeah. don't have that spirit in them. They don't have the spirit to recognize God in his good ways. He revealed himself to them because he revealed himself to all life on earth. But because he did not breathe life into them like he did Adam, they were not able or they just chose not to receive him, not to receive his fullness, right? That's probably why he breathed life into us, why we were made in his mold, meaning that we had his understanding. Plus, Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of knowledge, which made them aware, right? That's how they knew they were naked. That's how they knew to have sex. That's how they knew what to do. So that made them, as the devil even said, because God confirmed, you are now like God in that you can distinguish between good and evil. Those other humans on earth could not distinguish between good and evil for two reasons. They did not eat of the fruit of knowledge, and they did not have God's spirit in them to convict them. That is why they got washed away in the flood. You see? Now, does that mean that there were no beings left over after Noah was, was uh, born? Yes, but does that mean also that angels did not necessarily start fiddle farting around with Noah's bloodline again, thus creating a Goliath, or thus creating a new kind of version of the, uh, of the Nephilim? Well, That's we all, possible. Yeah, and the other thing we think is also that even though Noah and his three boys, his three children were of the pure bloodline, the wives of the three boys weren't necessarily. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that they had Nephilim, they had Nephilim DNA, which caused later the, the giants of, of the um, uh, Israelite era, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Goliath, Goliath. And, and his three brothers. Yep. And uh, yeah, Goliath the, the was alone. And Bashan and yep. all of those. So, yeah. so the Nephilim DNA continued after the flood, which means that somebody on that boat had those wrong genes, mm -hmm. which could also mean... W could have been the wives. Could have been yes, the wives. Could have been the wives. Could have been the wives, which would make sense because... They had chosen wives, which weren't supposedly their brothers and sisters. Right. Now, somebody just said, uh, Galen, you said they were like the animals. Yes, the ones that did not have God's life breathed into them, they would be just like animals. We would consider them Neanderthals or Neanderthal-ish kind of human beings, right? Then somebody else said, um, uh, is this the same spirit, what we're talking about, where God breathed life into Adam? Is this the same spirit that now comes to us through the New Testament? The answer is yes, but no. Meaning that when Yeshua passed on the cross, rose three days later, ascended and sent us the Holy Ghost, we were able to actually have God's, like, more of a pure version of the Holy Spirit living in us. Now, the difference is too, though, is that did they have a version of the Holy Spirit living in them? Yes, that is how we have the life we have. Life is God's Spirit. Science cannot explain life. How the heck does a rock ever become conscious of itself? Because that's actually what we are. We are all made of carbon. And you cannot put life into carbon. Only God can do that. Second thing is, even if they say they can't, they won't ever be able to do it. Second thing is, is that when we are washed clean of our sins, right, we are able to have that relationship with that Yahweh wished to have with Adam and Eve for all eternity. But when they sinned, it separated them. And the cross reunites us and his blood over us allows the right for the Holy Spirit God himself to enter into us and have relationship with us and so while it is the same spirit we are able to experience it in a more pure fashion I'm just so giddy right now because this is so right on isn't it awesome it's awesome so, it, it's so cool Lisa says my sheep know my, my voice. voice amen that is exactly what it, it is referring to mm -hmm. okay all right, you guys, we are coming up on the two hours. We won't want to make these videos too long. We're so sorry if we did not get to your video or to your comment. You guys save them for next week or write them. We will try to bring them up at the beginning of the video next week. But let me just say this, and Alex, of course, you'll have a moment. We thank you so much for this fellowship. And that's what this was. It wasn't us going through the Bible, telling you what to believe, telling you what to think. We did highlight points for you to go back and read and pay attention to. 
And of course, you're more than welcome to come back next week and go, hey, I read those passages and you know what? I noticed there was something sticking out at me here. There was something that was missing there, whatever it was. But this is the fellowship of the Bible read through. That's really what this is. It's not a Bible read through where we tell you what it says and tell you what to think about it. You guys have brought comments. You guys have pointed out topics that we may not have seen otherwise. And we are all going to grow immensely from this Bible read through fellowship in ways we do not even understand right now. We look forward to it. I'm Nathan Wheeler, the owner of the Shua Network, and I thank you very much for participating. Please remember on the 22nd of every month, we do hashtag be the light, where we light a candle in unity of those who are followers of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. We unite and say there is a better way to live in this world, a better way to walk, and a better way to just be a human being. I'm signing out with that, but Alex, give your final words, brother. Sign off and... Uh, Thank um, you for coming out. Yeah? Guys, thank you so much. This has been amazing. The idea of us doing this together forces all of us, I think, to read it, to really pay attention, to really want to be here together for each other and for the, for the book. Uh, it's special. It is not normal. It is special and wonderful. And thank you so much for being here with us and um, you know, bringing forth all these wonderful questions and topics. Mm -hmm. You're increasing our faith. Uh, it, this is not that I, I feel wonderful right now. Yeah. I am very giddy yeah. and that's a confirmation from the Holy Spirit that things that this was a good time that this was done well that this was good. Yeah. And so uh, thank you again. My name is Alex Lovovsky. I'm uh, I'm just his pal and I'm blessed to be his pal and uh, and we look forward to seeing you again next week and, and continuing on. He's not just my pal. He's my brother in Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Come on guys. Give him an amen. You guys. Thank you very much and do me a favor. Do, do me a favor and do somebody else a giant favor. If this first video, which was a template, this is us, we're gonna iron out the wrinkles of how this works, you guys, and how we talk, And but if this blessed you, share this video. Testify of this Bible read-through and how this blessed you today. Tell somebody else how powerful this is because I'm testifying, he's testifying that this is a very powerful thing. I can't think of a more powerful thing that we could do using the internet. So if this blessed you guys, please share this on your pages, your personal pages, your Twitters, your Instagrams, your Facebook, I don't care, whatever. Share this, let people know about next Sunday, 1 p.m. California time, we're gonna read through chapters 11 of Genesis through 20. Please read through those and let's talk more and we will answer more of your questions that you left behind today. But share this with people. Let us not be the only ones who are blessed by this amazing experience and amazing fellowship because God is with us on this. I am telling you the truth. Thank you. Be blessed. Be the blessing.